Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Bridges Conversations. My name is Steve Gibbons. I'm the executive director of the Bridges Foundation in St. Louis. Uh, we are an organization that offers the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius Loyola in everyday life. We are actually just completing this year's uh, retreat in the next week or two. Um, we have uh, information sessions over the summer, if this is something that you're interested in, interested in. and we'll start the retreat um, back up again in, in September. So there's our website there on the bottom of the page. If you're interested, please um, check us out, give me a call, whatever, whatever you need to do if you want to learn more about this. We are joined uh, today by Virginia Herbers. Uh, she is a retreat director, a spiritual director, an author, a uh, university administrator now, and um, she has spent most of her life as an educator, teaching students of uh, every age from, from kindergarten through university age uh, in, here in St. Louis, but also in Connecticut and New York and even Taiwan. So she was born and raised in St. Louis, the youngest of 13 children. She grew up on the south side. I'm a north side kid. She grew up on the south side uh, near Ted Drew's and Candy Cane Lane. And if you don't know what that is, you're, you're missing out. So um, after ministering for several years in religious life, she now serves as the director of mission formation at St. Louis University, working with leadership there and faculty and staff uh, to help them integrate Ignatian spirituality into the life and the Jesuit mission of St. Louis University. So welcome, Virginia. It's good to see you again. Thank you, Steve. It's great to be here. Thank you. Well, I'm gonna, we're going to get started, jump right into this. We talk for usually uh, 20 or 25 minutes. If you have a question and you're watching, and I know that some people are watching right now, uh, you can leave those questions right there in the Facebook comment section, and I will see them, and we'll get to those later on in the conversation. So let's begin this as I uh, kind of always do. Um, tell us a little bit about your background, your upbringing, where you were raised, your faith tradition. And uh, from there, how is it that you first came to experience um, the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius? Because that's kind of why we're, why we're here today. Sure. Sure. So just from that introduction, you already heard that I have been born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, family background was kind of traditional Catholic, so uh, Irish German family. So the practice of the faith was non-negotiable. Um, we went to mass every Sunday, you know, had the sacraments, all of that. So that that's kind of the background in the faith. Um, in St. Louis, uh, where you go, what the Catholic high school options are many. And so um, the girls, all my sisters and I had options for where we could go, but my brothers had no option. Uh, it was insistent upon them that they attend uh, the Jesuit University of St. Louis U High. So my, all my brothers were Jesuit educated, my father and his brothers were Jesuit educated, his, his father uh, was Jesuit educated. So the Jesuit tradition basically came through for me from a very young age in ways that I didn't recognize. Um, the ability to uh, understand faith, wrestle with faith, all of that. Um, so I, I myself am not Jesuit educated. So my introduction to all things Jesuit and Ignatian spirituality, and in particular, the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, came um, from my own experiences in spiritual direction. So most of my spiritual directors have been Jesuits. I walked through the 19th annotation retreat. I have yet to make a 30 day, but it is going to happen someday. Mm -hmm. uh, but I did walk through the 19th annotation retreat um, with a local Jesuit here uh, at SLU. And uh, that experience um, really helped me understand the exercises a lot better in a way that just set me on fire for wanting to be able to share that in a more concrete way. And that's how I landed here at SLU. Nice, nice. Those, those spiritual exercises are a journey, whether you do it on a thir over 30 days or whether you do it over nine months, it's a journey. Right. Uh, recently, you, you experienced a different kind of journey and a different kind of 
uh, of Ignatian experience. Tell, tell us a little bit about the pilgrimage you took. Sure. So one of the things I, I love about um, Ignatian spirituality in general is that, you know, I, I go on retreat every year. So you have an, I, I love to do the eight day silent retreats, which is kind of a smidgen of the 30 day. And I remember reading <clears throat> not long ago that the difference between a retreat where you actually just kind of go inward, get quiet and, and embrace and encounter God in the silence of your heart, your experience, your prayer can be contrasted with the experience of a pilgrimage where it's not going inward, it's going outward. So last summer, I had the incredible good fortune and blessing to be able to go on pilgrimage with three faculty members from here at SLU uh, on the Ignatian pilgrimage that walks in the footsteps of Ignatius through Spain and Italy. Uh, it's a collaborative pilgrimage with Holy Cross, the College of the Holy Cross out of Massachusetts. We also had colleagues from Xavier and from Marquette. So there were about 22 of us who went on this 10-day pilgrimage, tromping through Spain from Loyola to Manresa to Montserrat, um, and then landing in Rome. And it was phenomenal. It was really awesome. What a great experience. Yeah. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you, uh, because I had a good fortune recently to hear you speak, um, at one of our bridges, we call them our Majus meetings, which is our continuing formation for people who complete the retreat through us. And you were our, our speaker, and you and you had for sale at that your your book here, uh, Gifts from Friends We've Yet to Meet. Um, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that. Um, this book, it you know, it introduces readers to a number of of nameless characters from the gospel these these, these these people who kind of appear in these gospel stories we don't know their names very often um and yet uh they tell they they play an important role in, in these stories exactly um so you wrote about that but also about um how the stories from your own life come come to play so um talk a little bit about how this book um how it came about, what you're hoping to do with it. Yeah. So, um, you know, mo all of my life has been dedicated in one way, shape or form to ministry in the Catholic church. So the gospels have just been part of my life's existence ever since I started in Catholic school in kindergarten. Right. Um, and so playing with the uh, relationship between the gospels that were written 2000 years ago and the gospels that are still alive and in our experiences now is what I've been doing my whole life long, you know, whether formally in my master's degree or informally through teaching. Right? You're always trying to coordinate how the gospels or how the, the life of Christ can inform our own experiences in life. So, um, oh gosh, COVID and the pandemic lockdown provided a great opportunity to be able to codify some of the things that I've offered in retreat, some of the things that I've prayed with myself. And so basically I wanted to just collect those stories and put them together. Book form seemed the best way to do it. And the interesting thing was, as I collected the stories that I, I was telling, I did not purposely choose folks from the gospel that uh, were without names. So, for example, when, when I talk about that, I'm talking about people like the boy with the loaves and fishes, right? Or the the woman from Samar the Samaritan woman or um, the rich young man. So all these people, we know incredible things about them. And they had these magnificent encounters with Jesus during his life in uh, Palestine. And yet we can't name them. Even even as we can name the 12 apostles, the name of his mother, you know, other folks in the gospels that he cures, Jairus's daughter, you know, Cleopas, one of the disciples. So there are named characters in the gospels. So I noticed as I was collecting these stories for myself and putting them into written form, that all the stories that I had collected were these nameless characters. And so I really sat with that and I thought, okay, what does it mean then to have this meaningful, significant role in the life of God 
and yet not really make a splash in history. <laughs> and so as I sat with that particular question, I realized, isn't that really all of us? Isn't that most of us? You know, we, we do our best to live these lives of faith. We do our best to uh, follow in the path of goodness and right and truth. And, you know, is anybody going to be telling stories about me 2000 years from now? Doubtful. So that's where the genesis of the uh, book idea came about. And it really, you know, when I think about the, the intersection of that and my own commitment to Ignatian spirituality, it's the same thing, right? It's like, how do we take something that was fixed in a historical moment, but clearly universal in reach and make it personal and actually become accountable to what it, what it is asking of us? So that's where it came from. Yeah. You're, uh, I love the story of, uh, I mean, we all love the story of Jesus and the loaves and the fishes, but the one that you chose that has this little 12 year old boy and has always been my favorite, I think for the same reason, um, because it gives us a chance, right. To reflect on what do we have to offer? Right. 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 Yeah. Um, uh, also in this book, uh, what I found really fascinating and I, I i wrote a review of this on the bridges website and i said that there were several read aloud moments and for me those are when i i turned to my wife and say listen to this right <laughs> uh and the ones that for me that were those arose where were these instances in your own life where where god just kind of showed up mm -hmm. right and i think we all want those moments we see them happen in scripture and we and we think, well, why not me? You know, mm -hmm. uh, and as we learn in the spiritual exercises, that takes slowing down, paying attention, being willing to see that when it happens. Right. Mm -hmm. But talk a little bit about these these moments when God God just kind of shows up in our life. And, and I don't know if you want to talk about one of them that's in the book or not, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Um... You know, I kind of refer to those as inbreaking moments, right? When the experience of something beyond breaks through into the here and now. I'm a believer that those happen a lot, a lot, a lot. And it is simply a matter of tuning in um, and paying attention so that you can notice when they're happening, but also then recognizing it for what it is. You know, every... People will talk about it as coincidence, serendipity, whatever, that, that has no relation to anything beyond the here and now. Um, but what I've come to believe about these moments, and I, I have more than I can count in my own life, because I believe that the more you look, the more you see. I, the way I see faith and, and evidence happening is not that, okay, I'll believe it when I see it but the other way around. When I believe it, then all of a sudden I see things that have been right in front of me all along. Hmm. So, oh gosh, an example from the book. Um, uh, I don't, don't want to do any spoiler alerts. Probably the best one is when I, you know, I have this thing that I just had this deal with God from the beginning of time, really, where when I need a sign that things are going okay, you know, that I'm on the right track or that he's actually real and alive and cares about what's going on um, in my little life, that if I see a cardinal, and now I've extended it to bluebirds as well, <laughs> but when I see a cardinal, um, I just take that as a little pat on the back, like, yeah, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Well, there was a, a time in my life when things were not going well at all. And I happened to be pretty upset with the way God was running the universe and my little universe in particular. And so I was driving to the St. Louis airport to pick a friend up and um, I was really mad. And so I was alone in the car and I was just letting him have it. <laughs> like I was giving him a piece of my mind saying, you know, this is not this is not right. And that's not right. And where are you on this? And you promised me that and da, 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 the whole bit. And then I kind of threw this ultimatum down. And I said, if you were ever going to send a cardinal 
to reassure me that you know what's happening and that they, everything's going to be all right. You better send it now, buddy, and you better make it a big fat one. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't remember the timing of how long it was. I know it was in that same car ride, but as I approached an intersection where the light was turning yellow and I was in the wrong lane, I couldn't, I got even madder. I'm like, you couldn't even get me in the right stupid lane to make the turn to the airport. So now I'm really mad. So I'm slowing down at this intersection. And as I come to a dead stop at the intersection right there, first car there, the St. Louis Cardinals mascot, Fred Bird, jumps in front of my car from the gas station on the corner because they were doing a promotional from that particular gas station on that particular day. Now, I I would love to say that it made sense to me and it clicked right away that that was the biggest, fattest cardinal I'd ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> and that was God having a good old laugh. It did not register with me that those two points of contact were coincidental until about a week later when I when everything had demonstrated itself as working out and being okay. And then in reflection upon that doubt that I had, that fear that I had, that anxiety and anger that I had toward God, really, the prayer that I uttered, and then that immediate response that I didn't even recognize right away, those types of experiences are what we're talking about, uh, what I mean when I talk about in-breaking. You know, do they have, I, like I said, I, I think they happen all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's not a question of, is God doing this in my life? It's a question of, am I tuned into this? Am I actually, first of all, looking for it? And then second of all, even recognizing what I see when it shows up. So. Yeah. Thank you very much. I know that was the story you referenced. I was, I, that's the one I read out loud to my wife. <laughs> yeah. One of the good ones. <laughs> That's right. Um, you know, this this when I say this kind of prayer, I, I guess I mean um imaginative prayer that we learn in the yep. spiritual exercises, how to put ourselves in the stories, um, how to make ourselves even just open to mm -hmm. to a different way of seeing God. Um how aware of of what you learned in the spiritual exercises, how aware of, of that were you when you actually sat down to write? And, and what's the, how, how do those two things for you of, of prayer and writing, how do they, how do they fit together? Yeah. Um, I, hmm, that's a tough question. So the exercises I think have informed just about everything in my spirituality. Um, and not necessarily in a, a way that I'm cognizant of all the time, but in a way that is the undercurrent. It, it literally is the foundation. So the whole, whether it's the use of the imagine, imagination in prayer, whether it's um, the discernment of spirits and trying to figure out, is this a story I should tell? Am I on the right track with that? You know, God, is this, here? here's where it comes out in writing. Okay, God, is this story just for you and me? <laughs> or is this story ours that is meant for others as well? And I think that discernment in the writing process is probably uh, where I see my prayer and my writing coming into communication the most often. So that's one place. Another place is that as I'm writing, it's it's funny because I'm in the middle of another another book right now and just last weekend, I was polishing up one of the chapters and I realized, okay, I'm mostly there, but there's something missing. There's something missing. There's something missing. And I worked at it and I worked at it and I worked at it and I tried to pray about it and, and it was just not happening. And so what I did instead is I went out and I went for a long, long walk just out in the middle of the gorgeous day that it was last weekend. And something, there was an insight that just went plop right there as I was out in the middle of trying to just live life and air out the mind and the will and the, the control. And so that's how I see those two things happening. You know, was yeah. that a conscious prayer? Not necessarily, but it was definitely a recognition of what was happening in me and then a responsiveness to say, okay, there's way too much of me in this. I got to open it up 
and see what God's going to do with it. If that makes any sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're and the, these connections, so to speak, that you made with these nameless characters uh, that you end up writing about, would you say that any of those connections um, started out as times of prayer? And, oh, and, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All of them. Absolutely. All of them. The only one. So there's there's one chapter in that book that I never intended to write. <laughs> it actually came. It presented itself to me and said, this needs to be said. And it's um, it's the story. I, I think I called it the crowds at Capernaum. So it's not an individual. It's actually Jesus and his he, he's in Capernaum and he's healing everybody and he's they're bringing all their sick to him. And um, he spends all day and he's wiped out at the end of a day. And the next day he rises before sunrise, gets all the apostles and he says, we're leaving. We're not staying here. And they move on to another town. And then it says, and later on that day, more sick arrived for him to heal. And so that definitely came out of my prayer and what was happening exactly in that moment of my life, which was I was I had two different friends one of whom had just had a miraculous healing of her father in the hospital, really. I mean, he, he, he was practically already deceased, and then he, he wasn't. And another friend who lost her sister in this freak car accident that never should have happened. And so I was sitting there with wrestling with this idea of how come some people get the miracle and some people don't? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and how does that affect faith? And, and what does that mean in terms of relationship with God? So that one definitely came out very literally out of a life experience that I was praying with and, and trying to pray with other people through. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, we have a couple of comments and uh, one question so far. Okay. Uh, if, any, if anybody else is out there and wants to ask a question, now would be the time to do it. We'll probably be wrapping up within the next five or six minutes. First of all, you got just kind of a kudos from uh, Jim Scott, who says you are a wonderful writer. So mm -hmm. we, we Thanks, concur. Uh, Pat Norley Jordan, who is one of our actually one of our retreatants this year, says this is a uh, let me if I can put it up here. So uh, this is great. And uh, she talks about such simple the practices, how, how simple practices are alive in daily life. And then we got a question from uh, Dan Coughlin. Um, it's a two two parter. One's one we could probably spend a semester on, and uh, the other one maybe you can answer a little briefly. But he's wondering about your definition of soul, and and how do you think a person strengthens the health of his or her soul? Hmm. Definition. Oh, I think theologians can do a lot better job on that than I can. Um, soul, I think, is just that part of us that lives with God eternally. You know, it's the it's the part that knows God um, perfectly and uh, will never cease to be. So that's my little amateur definition. Yeah. How can how can someone strengthen the health of their soul? Oh, gosh. I'm going to be a big proponent of spiritual direction, a big mm -hmm. one. Uh, personal prayer, of course, if you're if you're Catholic, the sacramental life is a big one healthy relationships, having people in your life who will be honest with you, um, sometimes painfully so. I think that's important. But I think spiritual direction um, for those who are committed to a life of faith, a life of prayer, that is what has always kept me honest. You know, as a spiritual director myself, I find it beautiful to see how God works in people's lives and, and being able to accompany someone on that journey is really a gift and a privilege. So I, that's what I'm going to put out there as, in my opinion, the number one uh, tool that we have in our little belts. Yeah. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, and not just because I'm a spiritual director also, but, <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, I, I've benefited so much from my own, my own spiritual director over the years. He's, he's the one who has pushed me and not pushed, but, but, but helped lead me into, into some really important, things like uh, doing the spiritual exercises. So I, I maybe maybe end this conversation with with this question. Um, we are 
as I mentioned earlier, we're just completing the nine months of our retreat. Mm -hmm. uh, people are in what, what Ignatius calls the fourth week right now, which is the week of resurrection and joy and looking forward. Um, but we sometimes talk about the fifth week, uh, which is not officially a part of the exercises, but it's how do we live this out? You know, we've had this great experience. Um, how do we live the spiritual exercises in our regular, ordinary life? So even as we complete something, how do we take that forward? So how, how would you talk about that? I, I think there are some real easy um, tricks to that. Uh, first of all, maintaining, cultivating, strengthening a life of prayer. And what that means to me is committing to it, you know, finding a dedicated time, a dedicated space for it on a regular basis. It does not happen on its own. <laughs> so I think that's primary. Um, secondly, um, I think learning more, you know, making sure that you're having conversations with people who not just agree with you on spiritual things, but who think differently and who might challenge you a little bit and help you wrestle with God. I, I am a believer that God likes the wrestling match. I mean, at least he, at least God does in my life. Right. So that's how I grow is when I don't even realize there's a growing edge somewhere until it's presented as conflict or as um, crisis or something. And then, OK, I've got to pursue that a little bit. So I think that's another one. Um, I think, too, uh, having an accountability person, whether that's a spiritual director, whether it's, you know, a practice um, or a habit. I don't know. Simple little things like that. I think keep it alive and allow people to continue to glean the graces. Memory. That's another one. I'm sorry. That's, and that's the last thing I'll say. Mm -hmm. But I think being able to go back to those moments of grace and revisit them isn't just a walk through memory lane. It's actually uh, revisiting and revitalizing the grace that was very real in a moment in time and allowing it, just like the scriptures, just like the exercises from however many centuries ago, to come back into lived reality in the current moment. Yeah, thank you. Well said. Uh, well, we're coming up on a half hour here, so I think I, we don't have any lingering questions. Great. Um, thank you again, Virginia, for joining us. Um, uh, I've left her, her website here. If you're interested in learning more about this uh, book or, or the other ministries that she's involved in, uh, please please reach out through that website. Um, if you Again, if you want any information about Bridges and what we do, uh, please check out our website, reach out to me, and uh, we'll be happy to, uh, to talk to you about that. Um, our next scheduled Bridges Conversation will be on Friday, June 9th at noon. And I am waiting to hear from someone right now about who's going to be my guest. So right now it's a surprise, uh, but we'll, we'll have it figured out by then. So um, thank you. Thank you for those of you who have tuned into Facebook to watch. Virginia, thank you for your time. Thank uh, you. You're also coming back to um, our Magis program in the fall to be one of our speakers. So we'll, we'll look forward uh, to that again. So, all right. I think that's all for today. We uh, a few thank yous popping up here on the screen from people who've been watching. So thank you all for joining in and uh, have a good afternoon, everyone in Virginia. We'll see you soon. All right. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you Bye. all. Bye.